why is it that Western media loves to paint China as the bad guys, and every time there's a new piece of news to do with China, it's always negative and it's always misinformation? I wanted to get to the bottom of this. And I am by no means an expert in the news, uh, journalistic practices. I am just an everyday normal person that likes to look at both sides of the argument. And today we're going to be looking at an example that I found um, from the BBC, also in China, known as the Biased Broadcasting Corporation, which is kind of a fun acronym. So this piece covers the Xinjiang uh, Muslims and uh, the situation there. Now, there are many other videos on that topic, and I am by no means an expert, but I have just been researching the original reporters. Uh, I've looked at some other uh, reporters that have come out and said about how biased and misinformation has been spread, um, which we will get to in this video. So I'm expecting it to be kind of a long video today, and uh, we'll be looking at these different examples. So why don't we just jump right in? Okay, so the first one we have here is from the BBC, and it was published, um, the news broke around the 3rd of March 2021, that's when it's been uploaded to their YouTube channel. So why don't we just go ahead and take a look. So the new evidence of China moving Uyghur minority workers in order to uproot communities from the BBC News. Let's have a look. A BBC investigation has found evidence that China's policy of transferring hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities from northwest Xinjiang to factory jobs often far from home is being used as a method of uprooting and assimilating the population. Okay, so first of all, they're just the first lines is saying, um, and also look at the, the pictures in the background, you know, we have the Chinese flag, CCTV, and some guy that's just behind a, a fence working. Now, they've already painted in the first 20 seconds um, uh, how bad this situation is, and all they've mentioned is they've found new evidence. It's also uncovered possible connections between these workers and some major international brands. Uh, China says that transferring workers away from the region is a way of tackling rural poverty and unemployment. Our China correspondent, John Sudworth, has this report. So yeah, China has said this is a, their way of tackling rural poverty. And of course, BBC has said, no, this is a way of uprooting and uh, controlling the Uyghur, I can never say this, Uyghur, Uyghur population. Our China correspondent, John Sudworth, has this report. Okay, now, about this China John Sudworth um, reporter, he has already come under fire from the Chinese citizens for... for spreading this misinformation and he's actually left and gone to Taiwan over fears of his safety. Now I don't know the whole situation there but there he has done some pretty um, sketchy reporting in the past where he has claimed that the police have come and stopped him when in reality it was just a security guard for the uh, factory that he was working because he was reporting without a mask on and um, he didn't understand the Chinese and there was also a part, in fact, let me show you. So this is the evidence where we can see them blatantly lie. So he came outside and this guy, this guy said the reporter was not wearing a mask. So, and he was uh, filming um, the location. So he came outside to ask what he was doing. That's very interesting, okay? This comes from a BBC correspondent or a BBC journalist at the scene. And she says this. He can take me at my word. I have not taken any footage of him or pictures of him. <coughs> and he will not be seeing pictures of him on, the tel on any of our reports. But in the BBC's report, we still find him Mr. Jiang. The BBC reported led me to believe it was a police 
Chinese authorities who stopped the filming, but in fact, it was Zhang who did that. The BBC report implies he had something to hide, but he was just concerned that the BBC didn't ask for permission before filming him and what he believed is private property. So yeah, and they even said, <laughs> you can take me at my word. This footage will not be seen on TV and we will not be seeing him. But during the original reporting of this one, they make it seem as if they are being asked to stop filming because they're uncovering some, some large secret. Check out what the BBC calls evidence of forced labor. A Google Earth satellite image that was taken in 2019 that shows people moving between buildings. The BBC said the buildings on the left is a Kucha factory where forced labor is happening. The building on the right are a vocational training center, something the BBC claims to be a camp. But here's where they made a huge mistake. A local official told us that a vocational training center was once indeed located on this site. However, all trainees in the center graduated before October 2019. The buildings on the right are now completely empty and the ones on the left were leased to the factory in March 2020. So Sadworth's sporting labor camp doesn't even exist. This BBC reporter already has um, some questions over his integrity and how he's spinning these um, situations to paint the worst possible picture. So let's jump over to his report on this Uyghur labor. At this factory, the Uyghur workers are clearly visible, more than 2,000 miles from home, brought all the way to central China by a massive relocation scheme. Now the BBC has found compelling evidence of how it works. In this Xinjiang village, the authorities need a hundred people to send to jobs on the other side of the country. They set up a stall, but this 2017 state media report shows no one's interested. OK, so first of all, he's saying they need a uh, hundred people to relocate. It's not like they need it. It's not like they've been pressured into finding a hundred people. They are doing this in order to alleviate these people from their, their rural and poverty lifestyles. But the way he's delivering these lines make it sound like they are forcibly taking these people and moving them to other places. So they go house to house. If you stay here, this official says, you'll be married soon and never be able to leave. Will you go, he asks. <laughs> no, she says. But with a mixture of propaganda... The way they take these pictures and images, which was originally um, reported on by CGTN, um, is just incredible. The way they twist and change things to make it seem completely different to the original piece. So. There he's saying like, uh, you should you should go. Um, is that good? Is that okay with you? Heavy persuasion. The young woman eventually agrees. I'll go if others go, she says. The BBC has new evidence that this separation from family and culture is, in part at least, precisely the point. A Chinese study produced for senior officials says labor transfers help assimilate Uyghur minorities, transform their thinking and reduce Uyghur population density. The study was posted online in error. Some of Xinjiang's mainly Muslim minorities are sent first to the giant re-education camps where China says it's fighting extremism, then to the factories. <laughs> Yeah, you could classify them as re-education centers because they are being taught Chinese. A lot of these Uyghur Muslims, they don't speak any Chinese. So if they're going to work in the Chinese work system, they're going to have to learn the language. And these pictures that show um, barbed wire and these fences, this is because Uyghur, the, the Xinjiang province has a, a history of extreme terrorism that they've had to deal with. 
can be seen unbiasedly across all these different news sources. Very few have managed to leave China after their release. There were 200 workers in the factory. We sold children's clothes and we are obliged to sing the Chinese national anthem. They said, the faster you work, the faster we'll let you go. But most of those transferred to work have not been in the camps and are sent direct from poor villages. The study also outlines how they are transported in groups, accompanied by security guards, and put through political indoctrination. This is just an unprecedented authoritative source written by... Okay, now we get to this guy. Oh my god, it's like I'm traveling down this conspiracy hole, right? This Dr. Adrian Zend uh, was one of the first people to come out accusing China of detaining Uyghurs uh, and uh, also talking about sterilization in the Xinjiang province. So who is he? So he's, a, he's an evangelical scholar um, making these so-called reports in northwest China's Xinjiang Uyghur uh, Autonomous Zone. And his aims are to slander the policies in that region. But further point to how this um, Adrian Zenz... This Adrian Zenz is just spreading misinformation. Uh, we can point to this uh, French journalist, Maxime Vivaz, who has wrote a book, uh, The End of You uh, Give Fake News. Sorry if I'm saying this word wrong all the time. But this is what he has to say about Adrian Zenz's uh, reporting. He, Adrian Zenz, posted... He made this uh, information. -là. And the next day, on his account of Twitter, we can verify it. I've made the screen of the screen. And the next day, he puts the shoes with a little bit. He says, here's the shoes. Unfortunately for him, on the shoes, we see the mark of the shoes. And this mark of the shoes is made in Vietnam. Voilà. Voilà, voilà the kind of thing, 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 Voilà le genre de choses qu'ils euh, sont capables de faire, c'est-à-dire qu'ils mentent constamment. C'est qu'il a, qu a menti. Et d'ailleurs, il y a, y a un, un journaliste euh, occidental, je ne sais plus de quel pays, qui a, qui, a, qui a fait des recherches sur les témoignages des Ouïghours euh, qui racontent leur, leur misère. Alors, quand ils arrivent en Occident, on leur pose des questions, on leur dit est-ce que vous avez été frappé Non, non, non. Est-ce que vous avez été violé Non. Est-ce qu'on vous, vous a obligé à manger du porc Non, non, non. Et puis quelques temps après, quelques temps après, on voit les mêmes, bien habillés, dans des appartements magnifiques, on voit que l'argent est arrivé, et là ils disent oui j'ai été violé, battu, euh, on m'a mis de toute nue, on m'a obligé à manger du porc, etc. etc. So I think this guy is obviously one of the few journalists that really see through all of these all of this bullshit. So, uh, in question, the Adrian Zenz, uh, he posted a picture of uh, these Uyghur uh, forced labor workers writing in perfect English, help, I'm in jail, someone help me. Um, and he makes a good point. They don't even have a, a strong grasp on Chinese, but suddenly they can write English perfectly. And, um, and even the picture he posted to uh, support his claim uh, all of those shoes were made in Vietnam. And the thing is, what really annoys me is the Western media will jump on all of these accusations. They won't do their verification. They won't do even basic fact checking. They will just hype up these stories and they will just make them seem like they are fact, even though there are no credible and there are no credible sources. There are, like, this man, the second point he makes, when when they first asked these Uyghur um, immigrants that arrived to the U.S., were you ever beaten, raped, made to eat pork? They all said no. And then later on, suddenly, they've changed their stories after they've been uh, fed and dressed and housed. It's just incredible, the, um, the, the, the lengths that the U.S. and other Western countries will go to to discredit China. But let's go back to um, the original BBC piece. Really, leading academics and former government officials with unprecedented high-level access in Xinjiang itself. That drives home the implications of what is going on here. There are higher goals of manipulating population density and demographics that, in my opinion, are very concerning. And they really point us 
towards crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity is um, now defined as trying to alleviate people out of poverty. We we'll see later on that these people stay in the same locations and there's no upward mobility opportunities for them if they aren't given some assistance from the Chinese government in order to move to work in cities. If they stay in these farms, then their yearly salary is about 3,000 renminbi. It's about 300 pounds. Anyway, we'll continue. We found products that may contain yarn from this company on sale on Amazon in the UK. The factory says it no longer employs Uyghurs and Amazon told us it doesn't tolerate forced labour. And this factory makes plastic mouldings for some major international brands. So we've spoken to one worker here who has confirmed that as many as a few hundred Uyghurs are employed in this factory, but unlike the Chinese staff, they are unable to leave the factory premises. How are we supposed to believe these statements? And it's broadcast on public TV. Just mind blowing. Statement, the Chinese government said the study seen by the BBC reflects only the author's personal view and much of its contents are not in line with the facts. But in large part, it echoes government thinking. Some Uyghurs, it concludes, are unwilling to leave their homes, a problem that should be tackled with strong guidance and persistent measures. John Sudworth, BBC News, Beijing. And he, he, they frame it as if they're trying to hide something when they have these security guards. There's literally security guards everywhere in China. My building has security guards at the same of these people. They are not police. They are just old, they're just people working a job. They're like security guards in the US for more. But they're framing it as if like, oh, what secrets are they hiding behind here? This guy's probably like, why are they recording me? I'm just bloody doing my day job. Okay, so that was the original uh, BBC piece um, on, based on this, um, based on the... You get Uyghur, the Uyghur forced labor. Now, let's take a look at the original source or where they got most of this um, footage from. Welcome to the program. Villages in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region are some of the poorest and most isolated in the country. Many villagers there, women in particular, have never seen life outside their communities. Now, a government project in 2017 sought to put village women to work in another province. The goal was to empower them and help lift their families out of poverty. But in Pishan County, the move initially faced resistance from families who were not willing to let their daughters go. So what they're trying to do is alleviate poverty for these Uyghurs. Um, they're trying to uh, take them um, and put them to work so they can earn more money for their families. and. Uh, this is where the crux of the misinformation begins. So, okay, the, the garment factory leaders from Anhui are recruiting workers today, okay? So it's, it's like a, a normal um, recruiting initiative. They go and they ask people if they wanna, they wanna have some jobs. How was it framed in the BBC uh, piece? These, they are, they need to find a hundred workers for the factory. The announcement blared loud enough for most villagers to hear. Yet after two days, no one from Konabaza village in Pishan County showed up. At nearby Maza East village, the message also fell on deaf ears. So that is um, uh, an, a Uyghur um, that is explaining why some of these um, 
we other Uyghurs may not be interested in the program. Residents in this village in southern Xinjiang have farmed for generations. Some 40% of the population, mostly female, are poor, earning less than 3,000 yuan or $450 a year. Then an opportunity came. A textile factory in Anhui province wanted workers from the area. The Anhui Aid Xinjiang Committee had hired nearly 100 residents from other villages, but failed in Konabaza. See, and they're having a rational, reasonable conversation. Like, what are we doing wrong? Um, is there something wrong with the way we're betraying this message? They're not saying like, okay guys, quick, put them in the back of the van. We gotta handcuff them and move them as quickly as possible. They're actually trying hard to alleviate this community, to help this community, not forcibly take them away from their homes. A change in the group's recruitment style was in order. Before visiting families, they first shortlisted qualified villagers. 19-year-old Busnap is a high school graduate. She has stayed home most of her life, and her parents have started finding her a suitor. To her father, who's not working in Anhui was out of the question. See, this is, turns into more of a cultural discussion. The, these women aren't allowed their... They aren't... In this, in this Uyghur minority culture, the women aren't allowed to have their own opinions and thoughts about their future. Uh, it's up to their families what they can and can't do. And that man says that they're fine living that way in the village, but who knows if their daughter has that same opinion or not. We find out later, she probably doesn't. Most girls in the village devote their lives to their families after finishing junior, senior, or vocational high school. Wuznap has three sisters. Her 28-year-old elder sister is the mother of three kids. As her father speaks with the work group, Wuznap keeps her head down. <laughs> so how convenient, right? They during the PBC documentary, they only said the "haba hao si bu sing" as if he's pressuring him to go. But look at the, what he's actually saying: like, go and try it. If you don't like it, they will buy you the tickets to come back. That is such a difference in the way that the, they're portraying these two different pieces. Like, the BBC editor is like, okay, how do we make this look as bad as possible? They've completely changed the tone and the actual message of this, this original documentary to fit their anti-China needs. Just so frustrating. When you, when you, when you look at the BBC... A piece, and then you look at the original documentary. I don't think it would take anyone to realize how skewed and different it is. Uh, 
I mean, look at that. The guy's like, maybe I said something wrong, you know? I'm just trying to help them out so that they can have a better life for their family. But what does the BBC News say? They were convincing them to go, making them go. That guy's showing a lot of self-reflection. He's saying like, mm, you know, I was just, when I saw her crying, I had some empathy, you know. I, really, it's just baffling. In the home of Guliki's another girl in the village, the offer was flatly rejected. Gulikis, who's 19 years old, learned tailoring in vocational high school. That makes her a perfect candidate for the job. If she doesn't accept the job at Anhui, the only option for her is to get married. If如果去内地做这个服装厂做的话,你的收益是肯定会很高的,你的工资,如果能够达到三五千都有可能,如果你去在家里面就可以做几顿饭,那这样的话对你可能就荒废了,你学的这些专业都荒废了,对不对?身
See? That this is the part that the BBC does not want to show you when they're saying, you know, look, it's up to them. It's their own choice. We're here to help. We're here to help a lot of other ethnic minorities and a lot of the rest of China. We have all moved on. We have all tried our best to go out and, and make money for our families and to have a better life. But at the end of the day, it's up to them. If they want to stay here in this life um, doing doing the same thing they've done for generations, then that is totally up to them. But the BBC won't show you this part, will they? But the group wasn't about to give up just yet. To encourage the villagers, they enlisted the help of Kuriet Hugabla from Yitian County, some 300 kilometers from Pishan. She was among the first batch of girls from Xinjiang to be sent to Zhejiang province, where she worked in a textile factory. In 2013, she and 30 others worked in Anhui. Her hard work and skill won her the title National Model Migrant Worker in 2016. She's now a veteran worker and manager. So they actually bring in uh, another Uyghur that has already moved to Anhui and done the, this work. And she's, she's, you know, telling them what they need to hear, I think. They're saying, you know, there are opportunities for us outside of this village. Now, I know what a lot of anti-China people will say. And it's just like always the same. Like, oh, she's just being paid by the CCP to say this. Oh, this isn't really what she thinks. All of this, like, just in instantly thinking the worst. When I think this program has already shown in a very authentic way, how they're trying to deal with this situation. Anyway, so um, so they try and uh, get more workers to go. They find someone that is willing to go, and their husband is a cook. And they even uh, try and um, bring him along, which I think they do successfully do. Now, they've they've um, managed to get some workers from this village to to go and live and this is another part that the bbc documentary just doesn't show at all it just shows them crying and like they've been torn Many apart years for the village to send their people to another province on the eve of the girls departure villagers held a farewell party for them <laughs> Wow, what a big change that is from the BBC documentary that is trying to paint it as if they are being ripped apart and split up. Those parents, of course, we can all empathize for them. Their, their, their daughters are having to go away and they're being left alone. But both of them have changed their opinion. It may be painful, but they can understand and see the benefits. After completing their training at Pishan Vocational High School, nearly 100 girls were ready to go. Most of them were leaving home for the first time. Their families came to say goodbye, carrying their hopes and dreams. See, this is the part that the BBC will edit together as if like, oh, you know, they're being ripped apart from each other, but really it's just an emotional goodbye. From their villages, the women journeyed thousands of kilometers to Anhui province, where they were to start life anew. When we come back, we'll... Okay, and then um, we see them settling in with their new life. Setting foot in this garment factory was like seeing an entirely new world for the girls from Pishan. See, and they're, they're starting to learn the Chinese language and they're starting to see different parts of the world, like the bed, the AC, the hot water. And to me, this is very warming. This is very uplifting that they're, that they're able to get this opportunity to, to not live in, in poverty, working the farms. 
okay, working at a garment factory may not be the most glamorous job, but at least this gives them opportunities to gain experience, move up in the economic world, and to, to see more of the world. A new experience for the girls buying groceries. <laughs> <laughs> Their Chinese is about the same as mine, their accent probably. But see, um, now I think uh, if you want to see more about this documentary, you can watch it yourself. It, it, it just goes into how they are settling in with their new life. So I think this gives a good glimpse into the disinformation and the way that the BBC totally misportrayed this original documentary to fit their narrative. And it's something that I think we need to talk about more is how the West is always lying and spreading misinformation about these different topics in China. And it's, it's not hard to believe why so many people are losing faith in the press. I rarely believe any news um, that comes from Western sources about China anymore because I've been living here. I see it. And um, although I may not be in Xinjiang boots on the ground, the way that they spin these stories is just incredibly dishonest. And I think to end this video, um, I'd like to show this uh, last piece about a ex-journalist that goes into details about how they are lying and uh, spreading misinformation, um, the Western media. I worked for a newspaper in England, in Britain, the Britain's largest daily circulation newspaper for six years, so I do have some knowledge of how the media works. Right now let's talk about propaganda and spin and anti-China propaganda and where the media gets its stories from. There are two main sources of information that they get these stories from. The media's main source of information is a man named Adrian Zenz. Adrian Zenz, Zenz, whatever you want to call him. He's German and he's also a, a religious zealot. The BBC asked me if I could find something and I told them no. It's too difficult, it's too hard, there is not enough evidence. The BBC later approached Adrian Zenz again with a commission, which means the BBC were, are and have paid Adrian Zenz to find something. Another source of um, information, you can call it, or disinformation as I would prefer to call it, on the situation in Xinjiang with Uyghur people, or a certain section of Uyghur people is actually, um, now you're not going to believe this, but it's actually the media itself. You can see here that this Adrian Zenz person may be questionable in his motives himself if he's being paid to try and find something. That is all I have for this video today. Um, I just really, watching these two pieces um, after doing a lot of research, or l not even research, but just looking at all these different sources um, uh, about China, um, it just really boggles my mind how people still believe the, the Western narrative um, that is spouted uh, about the Chinese situation and they just take everything at face value. Um, I think uh, you can disagree with me, you can, um, this of course is just my own personal opinion, uh, if you disagree with me please let me know in the comments if you think there's anything I've overlooked. I am by no means saying this is definitive. Um, I am not a journalist. Like I said, I am just a, a normal person that's trying to look more into this situation. And when I found the BBC piece and then the original documentary piece, I thought I'd do a video on it because the way that those two portrayed the situation were completely different. So thank you very much for watching this video. Um, I actually had way more other examples about how the West just completely lies um, or blames China when they have no proof. If you'd like to see some more videos like this,
please uh, leave a like and a comment, share this with some friends. I would love it if this video got over a thousand views. That would be a huge benchmark for my channel. Um, and if you can give it, let's do a, a like goal of, I don't know, 50 likes. Um, this uh, video has uh, taken me some time to put together and I hope you appreciate the effort. Uh, if you made it this far, please consider subscribing. Thank you. See you in the next video.